Okay, so uh, today we're going to continue on with 1.6. There's a couple words I want to discuss. Some words I was definitely getting a lot of questions on that I think some people just didn't understand. So, um, obviously we're talking about polygons, you know, the straight line figures, right? So the book definition of a polygon, one more time, this is something we talked about last Friday, so this shouldn't be new, you shouldn't have to scramble to write this down. Something that we talked about last Friday, unless you're gone, was that polygons are made of many angles, that's what your book says, but the way we draw them is we use segments, straight lines, they have to be on the same flat surface, same plane, go planar, so like one marker board, and you draw all those segments, they have to be connected to two or more others, so each segment has to be connected to two or other, so that means their minimum size is a triangle, and it goes up from there. They have to be connected at endpoints, I put an endpoints in quotes, and then those, um, those segments you're connecting can't be in a straight line, they can't be collinear. They have to be a flex in the road. That way you're making all these, all these figures, all these polygons, right? Um, now, some of the key words you need, do need to know. Vertices, or a vertex, that is where those endpoints are. The points of intersection, the end, the end caps, right? Those are those called vertex or vertice if you go plural, right? Um, and then the edges or sides of the figure, right? So this is something we talked about last week. Any questions with the review of the definition? Now the questions I was getting a lot yesterday. It wasn't just your class. It was uh, period seven. It was period five. It was just this term that um, that was in your book. We talked about it last Friday, but I think some people just like forgot about it. Um, it is the idea of what convex and concave are. So here's the here's the convex, right? That's the book definition. This is what a convex picture looks like. It's a big, fluffy pillow. Very open on the inside. Doesn't matter the shape, very open, right? Um, concave is pretty much the opposite of that. So that means on a concave picture, there would be some dent on the inside. There's literally a cavity on the inside. Does that make sense, like what concave looks like? I can look at it in the first second, see, okay, there's a cavity, there's a dent, it's automatically concave, it's got a cavity. All right, questions at all about convex versus concave? I think that was some of your homework problems, some people were just like, there's a lot of questions like, is it convex or concave? I don't remember what those words mean. There's a picture. I can look at it in the first second and tell you which one's which. Questions on convex concave. Okay, now one of the new words we have not discussed, it was one of those things I was waiting to today to discuss so you can get some time to work on your homework, was obviously the different names of your shapes. Um, so these are the names we talked about yesterday, right? So it was triangles, the first one. Um, now we have seven types of triangles. Try to be specific if you have a picture of a triangle. What type is it? What type is it? Is it acute? Is it right or obtuse? Is it scalene, isosceles, equilateral? Try to be specific. This one is scalene. All three walls are different. They're not marked. It's acute. All the angles are less than 90. So I can tell it by two names. Um, it is convex. It's a big fluffy pillow. It is, now the other words we're going to talk about is regular versus irregular. We'll talk about that here in a second. Um, now the next one was a quad. Quadrilateral is a four-sided figure. Now it could be specific, it could be like a rectangle, it could be a square, it could be a trapezoid, a parallelogram. Um, this one is just a random quad. There's no markings or anything on it to tell me otherwise. Um, none of the walls look like the same size, so uh, it is convex. Um, it's a convex picture, there's no dent on the inside. Um, so yeah, so pretty straightforward. Um, Pentagon is five-sided. Hexagon is six, heptagon or seven gon or septagon, octagon, that's with an A. Some people were trying to ask me how to spell that earlier, it's with an A, octagon, right? Nonagon or nine gon, I don't really care. Some people were putting nine gon on the paper, I'm fine with that. It's, it's in the book, I mean, it's literally called a nine gon. I just like the word nonagon, that's the correct one. Decagon is 10, hendecagon or 11 gon, and then dodecagon. Those are 12. Okay, questions on the different names. Okay, now, two new words we have to discuss. These are the two words that were in the homework some people were asking. I was waiting to the day to talk about it. Regular versus irregular. Very clear distinction. Most pictures are irregular. Most. What makes the difference? You know the definition. Regular pictures 
And this, I know this is going to seem really weird when you think about the like English definition uh, versus kind of what what math is telling you here. Um, a regular picture is anything where the walls are the same size and the angles are all the same. So let me give you an, let's give let me give you a regular triangle. Here's a regular triangle. All the walls are the same. All the angles are the same. Does that make sense? That is a regular triangle. Now, we know specific names about that. What else could we call it other than regular? Equilateral. Equilateral, there's one. What else? What's another word we call it? Acute. Acute, number one. Now we call it acute. And what else? There's another term we can call it. So we're going to check all the times for Friday. It's equilateral. It's acute, it's a triangle, it's regular. It's equiangular. That was a word we used last Friday. Equiangular, all the angles are the same. That's what makes regular. I know that seems really backwards. Like, because when I hear the word regular, I'm thinking like very plain, generic. It means that everything's the same. They're all equal. Equal angles, equal walls. If one of the walls was not marked, it would be irregular. Irregular pictures are like 90% of the pictures you see in your textbook. Like something's different. Like two walls are different sizes, right? I don't care that maybe the angles are all the same. You can definitely see these walls are different sizes, correct? That's irregular. Automatically. Like the walls are different. The angles could be the same, I don't really care. But if everything matches, then it would be regular. So this is irregular. Something something was off. Not everything was perfect. Okay, what would be a quad that has all the angles the same and all the walls the same? Square. Square. A square is a regular quad. It is a regular quad. Right? Uh, it's equal angular, it's equilateral, you know, it's got the same walls, same angles. But regular means all of them match. If, if some are different, it's automatically irregular. Do we understand the differences now between the words? I can look again in the first few seconds and know. Do they look the same or are they not? Like, in fact, here's a weird thing. Other than the top two pictures up here, other than the top two, all the pictures I gave you were regular. Very pleasing to the eye. The stop sign, that is a regular octagon. The honeycomb, this was a regular Hexagon. All the walls are the same. All the angles are the same. I made, I made it that way. It's just easy to look at. The Pentagon building is designed perfectly. All the walls are the same. All the angles are the same. It's very symmetrical on the inside, too. It's unnerving to people when you're inside of it, I guess. All right. Questions at all about the word regular versus irregular? Some of we didn't discuss. I thought we probably should. Okay. I feel better about the homework a little bit. Okay, now let's get to those other things that are in your homework. Obviously, we the big elephant in the room is all those formulas you had to know, right? Boom. All right, so uh, let's see. There. Okay, all the formulas in the in the room. Okay, these are the ones I want to go through a couple examples of these. Uh, because obviously a lot of your homework was just words and vocab, but there was a sloppy promise where I asked you, okay, find the perimeter on this picture. Find the area. And I just kind of turned you loose yesterday. I didn't really do a lot of examples. I thought maybe today we probably should talk about some stuff. That way you feel a little more comfortable with what you have to do. Because I didn't try to assign anything like devilishly hard. I just want to see kind of what you could remember from like junior high days, maybe earlier math problems you've done in maybe fifth or sixth grade. But let's talk about some words. So let's start with a triangle. Let's do some examples. So let's say I had to find the area of this random triangle. It's a random triangle. Well, if you look at area, you have to know the height of it, and you have to know the base, how long the base is. Those are the only two numbers. It doesn't matter if the triangle is a right triangle or obtuse, or you know, in this case, acute. It doesn't matter. You take height times base. This will give you the area. Now, if you don't remember what area is from what we talked about yesterday, it's how many little square tiles can fit on the surface. Like this room has area. You can see it. There's tiles on the floor, right? So it's area of the room, right? Or area of this triangle. So what you do is you take base times height, 
and then you cut that answer in half. So let me give you a couple numbers here. Let's say the height, let's say that was 10 inches. Now let's say the base is 8 inches. Okay, those are my two numbers. So what you do is you take 10 times 8, and then you cut that answer in half. So 10 times 8, that's what, 80? And we cut it in half, or divided by 2, what's 80 divided by 2? And your answer is inches squared, or square inches, however you want to say it. Because you're looking for how many little squares fit on the surface. Does that make sense, what you're doing? That's a triangle. Now, I don't care if it was a right triangle. Now, if you had a nice, clean right triangle, fine, find the name. Maybe this is 4 and this is 5. Perfect. Multiply, you know, multiply the height times the base, because it is perfectly like L-shaped. So, 4 times 5, and then you cut that answer in half. Maybe these are in centimeters. So four times five, that's twenty. Cut it in half, and we get what? Ten. Ten centimeters squared. Little square centimeters. Okay. Do we feel comfortable with what area it is for triangles? Anyone? Anyway? A little bit better about it. Okay. Now I don't even care if it was an obtuse triangle. At like I don't care if it was obtuse. You still follow the same formula. So I'm going to use, just use these same numbers just to kind of mess with you here. So if I give you a triangle, it, let me know if you guys can't see this over there. So can you guys see that? Okay, somewhere. Okay. If you have an obtuse triangle where there's an angle bigger than 90, you still use the height. I don't care that the height was outside the triangle and the base is over here. Like the base is just that little piece over there. They're not even connected. You still take height times base. So if this was 10 and this was 5, you'd still multiply 10 times 5. Height times base. You get 50, you cut it in half, you get what, 25 square inches? That could fit in there. Questions at all about how to find area? Now that's different than perimeter. Perimeter is the fence. So if you had to do perimeter on this picture, and maybe the numbers were like this is 12, and this is 14, fine and dandy. To find perimeter, you just add those three numbers up. Okay, that's what you do, you just add 12, 14, and 5. That's perimeter. Questions? Okay, now let's talk about rectangles and squares. Okay, rectangles and squares all have the same formula. Um, I'm going to use this room as an example, because it's nice to see like an actual image in your head. Uh, so everyone look at the floor. Do you see the other square tiles on the floor? Area would represent, it would be how many little tiles are on the floor in here. That's what area would represent, how many could fit on the surface. So one of the questions I always get is like, Ward, why don't you have carpet? Carpet's nice. You take off your shoes, kind of relax, it feels nice on the feet. It costs a lot of money to put carpet in a room. And plus, in like... Like in this room, you'd have to replace the carpet like every few years because it would be trampled, it would be discolored, it would have mildew, it would like, be gross, you'd have to replace it. Like in the media center, they always replace the carpet. They're doing it actually quite a bit, you just never notice because they have to use the same government issued carpet. So it's always usually like the same color. Uh, but the idea is like, what is it? Well, if you took the room, and this room isn't perfectly square, it's not, it's actually a little bit elongated. So maybe this room, like going to the back, is like 24 feet, and this way is like 30 feet, I think. That was the last number I got when I measured. So it's 24 by 30. To find area, or how many little tiles are on the floor, you multiply these two together. Right? That's all you do. You don't cut it in half, you don't do anything. This is length times width. You can actually see the formula there. Length times width. So 24 times 30. What is that? Um, let's see. 24 times 30. Sorry, Father, but Mr. Hag wants you to take, it's Tom Chizik who wants you to connect with him. Oh, perfect. I tried to call him earlier and he didn't pick up. Sure. Thank you. Yep. All right, let me drop him here. He's on 701. All right, do, do I just type in 701? No, is it not? I'll send it to you. Okay, so for a rectangle, it's 24 by 30. That's this room. Well, when I multiplied it, I got 720, and that's feet squared. That's how many little tiles are in here. Well. If you think about it, like this is a government-owned building, right? So the idea is that if we're going to put carpet, we have to have government-issued carpet, and we have to pay whatever price that they have marked. That means their standards, right? Well, government-issued carpet could be a dollar fifty a square foot. 
one single square foot could be $1.50. So I would take 720 of them times $1.50. So you're looking at just this room alone with government issued items, I'm looking at spending about a thousand bucks on carpet in this room. Now there's 50 other rooms in this building. Like that's why it's not cost efficient. Tile you don't have to replace for 20 or 30 years. But carpets, you know, every five or six because of the amount of traffic we see. So it's just not cost efficient. You can, do you see how like the numbers can like go like explode at that point? Now, what else like would be practical for in terms of area? Well, if, let's say you're putting like an addition on your house. You're doing like a deck, right? You're gonna put like a square deck in the backyard, and you're gonna put a pool or something like that. Well, if you're gonna add a deck to the backyard, it's nice to know area because number one, you have to know if you can fit it in the backyard. But number two, by knowing area, I can tell you how many boards you need because a board, you know, a two by four or whatever, has a certain area, a certain coverage. So by knowing what the area of the, the actual like patio that you're gonna put on. I can tell you how many boards you need roughly, just like a real quick count. That way you get cost cost efficiency. Like that's how a construction worker would give you a cost estimate. You know how many rough how many boards they're gonna need. Now that's not including the boards underneath it to hold it up structurally, but he gives you like a cost. They always kind of underestimate it because they don't know the problems are gonna arise, but it's just a quick ballpark. So like maybe I can't afford the thousand dollar carpet. Probably should go another route, right? That type of thing. Alright, questions at all about area. Now, perimeter is easy. You just add up the four walls, 30, 30, 24, 24. You just add them up, there's a perimeter. So like, that's if you're going to put in like a room, you're going to put up like molding around the bottom. Like that's the splash pad around here. Or you're going to put crown molding around the top. Or maybe you're going to paint. You could talk about perimeter. Maybe you're going to put like a little like, wallpaper strip. Or something like that. It's a decorative thing. But those are like the purposes why we have area and volume. Or area and perimeter. Now, circle, on the other hand, is different. This is one that, you know, I really kind of just threw at you yesterday because we never really talked about circles. Circles are not, they're not polygons, right? Circles are what we call a conic section. A conic section is a type of curve, right? Polygons are anything, you know, triangle to dodecagon, deck, now they have straight edges. But when you get to the conics, that's a curve. It's not a polygon. It's completely different. Um, the definition of a conic, it's, it's when you take a geometric figure like a plane and you cross it over a, a cone, a circular cone. And what I mean by that is let's imagine you had an ice cream cone in front of you. This is always the image I always try to give you. And you have your ice cream cone right here, 3D image of a cone. And imagine you took a bite out of it. Right? You took a bite out of the cone. There's no ice cream in there or whatnot. You just took a bite. What would, what would it look like in the front if you just took a bite out of that? What would you see? What? The inside of it. Yeah, you see the inside, but you probably see something like this, right? You kind of see this little like horseshoe looking figure, right? Does that make sense? You like you took a bite out of the cone. Here's the weird part. This is the mind trip. That's not because your teeth are curved. That curve that happened in the cone has nothing to do with your teeth. That's what everyone always thinks. So, oh, that looks like my mouth. That looks like the teeth mark. It's not. Um, because you could have got that same result. If you took your cone, here's my cone, I'm just turning it end over end, and you ran a bandsaw, like you just put it flat on a table and ran a bandsaw that's right flat on a table and just ran a bandsaw through it. You would have cut this part off and it would have been a perfect cone again. It would have been this shape because of the bandsaw. It's because a plane crossed the front of the cone. A flat surface, your mouth is a flat surface. I know your teeth are curved, but the plane is where your mouth ended. And you can still get the same result with that or a bandsaw, which is flat, if that makes any sense to you. Um, now that shape would represent a parabola. Now if you had two cones stacked on top of each other, because that's how they kind of make cones, right, like that, um, you would have a hyperbola, because there'd be another one down here, right at the bottom, because you'd have that flat surface go all the way through the front. So it's one of those things you don't see. Now on a cone, if you were that crazy person that took your cone, put the entire thing in your mouth, and then bit down. So you'd have your plane going this way, like your whole mouth covered it. You would actually make an ellipse. The cone would be at an angle, okay? Um, but if you were to look at it straight on, top down, it looked like a circle. It's, it's all about a matter of perspective. Um, 
the weird thing is, like, um, so try this, try this at some point. If you have a coin in your pocket, like a penny, a dime, a nickel, a quarter, it doesn't really matter, and you put it down in front of you, and you look at it like really close, but at a weird angle, not straight up above it, but at an angle, it looked like an ellipse. It looked, at, it looked like this. It'd be elongated. It'd be like stretched to your vision. But if you looked top down, it'd be a perfect circle. This is all a matter of perspective, but it's still a curve, right? Well, that's what a circle is, right? It's just a matter of perspective of some type of conic that you're looking at, some type of cone. You just can't see the rest of the cone. So, when we go back to my formula, question. So then what's a parabola? A parabola is that, that horseshoe shape in a cone. It's just one of them. It's not two. That would be a hyperbola. It's just the top half versus the bottom half. Does that make sense? Now, a circle. Let's say I'm going to use the example. I didn't really, I don't think I did one yesterday. Did I talk about a car tire? Yes, yes. Hey, kind of. Okay. We'll continue with that idea. So let's imagine you had your car tire. I'm going to make it smaller. Let's say that you went from the inside of your car tire to the outside, the radius of your car tire. And let's say that was 15 inches. Now, it's not. Car tires are way bigger than that. Let's just say it was 15. You had a really small tire. Um, 15 inches from inside outside. If I want to know how far it is around that circle, it's way further than you think it is. In fact, what you do is you take, to find circumference, the distance around perimeter of it, right, circumference, you take 2 times pi, which is 3.14, times my 15 inches. 2 times pi times r. That's how I find circumference. Well, if I actually multiply those, you get something like 90, you get like 91. So 2 times 15 times 3.14. That's the beauty of having that up there in 3.14. I go a couple decimal places. It turns out to be 94.2 inches around. That doesn't sound that impressive. Until you figure out what that is in terms of feet. So that is definitely not 15 inches. I did not draw that to scale. But 94.2 divided by 12 inches, that's 7.8 feet around. That's a long way. And that's, that's underestimating your car tire. Car tires are way bigger than that. What most people don't know is that a car, the ECU of your car, is programmed to turn that wheel so that you travel a certain distance per hour. Right? So if you're going down the highway at 55 miles per hour, the car is programmed so that when it spins the tire once, it knows you will travel 7.8 8 feet. It knows that. So what it's doing is it's figuring out, okay, how many times do I need to turn that wheel in one hour so that you'll go exactly 55 miles. That's what it's doing. So when you change your tire, let's say you went to the shop or you went to your garage, you found new tires in your garage and you put new tires on yourself. You'll either be speeding or going too slow because the ECU in the car didn't know that you changed tires. So if your tire's bigger, you'll travel more distance per hour if you're speeding. If you have smaller tires, like you let your car tire deflate, lose air, you're going slower than you think you are. Because it's a smaller tire compared to what it thought it was. It's a really weird concept when you start to think about in terms of like why circumference is such a big deal. Okay? But that's distance around, right? Now, area. Area is the, the actual like number of square tiles on a circle. It's uh, area of uh, like a basketball court, you know, how much you know, area I need in the middle of the court. Right? So the idea is you take pi times your radius squared. And that's how I always remember area. It's always how many squares are there in it. So as you square the you square the, uh, the label. So 15 squared, which is like 225, you take it times pi, 3.4, and you get this astronomical number. How many tiles are in there? Okay, does that make sense like the concepts of what we're doing there? Area versus perimeter. Circumference, sorry. All right. Now, I'm going to leave this, this chart up here because we do have homework. Um, one of the things we're going to go over tomorrow, uh, one of the things we're going to cover is we're going to cover three dimensional objects. We're going to start that tomorrow. Um, I don't know if I have you tomorrow. I haven't seen the final schedule. I think we go through period six tomorrow, so I might have you for a little while. So we'll start three dimensional. Um, I believe I might have you as well on Friday.
but Friday is like a 20 minute class. I haven't seen the schedule yet. I'm thinking no. Okay. I haven't seen the kind of debate on the show. Is it a short period tomorrow? I think so. Okay. All right. So there you go. We're not going to get homework or anything like that. We do have homework due. So let's say I see you tomorrow, homework's due. If I don't see you tomorrow, let's do whatever day you're back. Does that make sense? So like, I don't want to like, maybe we have like a short period and I'll never see you. Um, let's say. Just do it, let's do whenever you're back in my classroom. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's easier for I can do. Okay, here's your chart. I'm gonna put that back up there. I'm gonna leave this up here to give the rest of time to work. If you want to give me time to work and ask questions and move around and kind of relax. So, I, what time are we out of here? Is it? Yeah, it's so early. We're asking. No. I don't know if it's like 49.